Okay, I think we are ready well, to I go. Had, I had a I'll do that. I don't want to do that. Okay, everybody. Um, I think I mentioned that Barry cannot be here because he's ill, and Diana, I understand, cannot be here because she's not supposed to be in public meetings for a while. So that's it, but we will have quorum, so I think, once we call. So that's it. So, since the meeting's ready to begin, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll to verify the presence of the quorum. Uh, board Member Hawkins Board Member Sanchez. Present. Uh, board Member Smith. Here. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Board Member Curry. Here. Uh, board Member uh, Chair Clegg is here. I forgot the next one. We have uh, okay. four present. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is a, an agenda that was distributed earlier. Um, I'd like to have a motion to adopt. Moved. Second. Thank you. Are there any changes, any comments about the agenda? If not, I think we can do a voice vote to accept the agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. We have an agenda. Uh, we had minutes from our April 4th meeting that were um, linked through the agenda online. I think people, uh, hopefully everybody saw them. Uh, I'd like to have a motion to accept the minutes. Moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments about the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And any abstain? Thank you. Uh, chair's report, I don't have anything to report. I talked to Barry yesterday, and he didn't have anything to add either at this point, other than what's already going to be presented to us today. Okay, on item number five is our proposal to amend the charter by moving municipal elections to even years. I think that we should have received copies of a short presentation. There's copies here for members of the audience if they wanted to see them. And then we also had a rather long memo from City Attorney Bashoon, which was sent out today. I don't know if she's going to be here or not, but I think our primary focus this morning is on um, Mr. Dean and the young men whose names I am so sorry I did not get. But maybe they'll be in the minutes, Michael, when they introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Mr. Dean, I, are you taking the lead on this presentation? Uh, I, I am. I'm not in the chair. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, as you had mentioned, um, it's a short couple slides we're going to continue to talk about. What are the implications for shifting to even year elections for the municipal election? And here with me today are two members from the Election and Voter Services and I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Aaron Grossman with oh, sure. Minneapolis Election and Voter Services, uh, Supervisor of Election Administration and almost a number of different programs uh, help our, run our ranked choice voting elections. So that's why I'm looped in here to help uh, that's even your elections and can speak to specifically the impact of ranked choice voting. We've been working with Ray and my colleague Jeff. I'm Jeff Nerbrook with Minneapolis Elections, and I am um, in charge of our poll worker training and a lot of our election day operations, and uh, can speak to a lot of the, the processes and procedures in the polls to the extent this, this would have been that. Who wants to go first? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just go with the, the first slide, uh, what are the, some of the legal implications. As we've talked about previously with the optical scan voting system, it only allows for a single ballot uh, to be used. And, um, you can see the statute, which is referenced, and I believe that's also a reference in uh, Ms. Bashoon's letter to all of you as well, which outlines several of these things. And when it says ballot card in the first point, that means a piece of paper. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So it could be a long piece of paper, but it's so one a physical object. Okay. okay, thank you. So what would happen if we had, say, multiple charter questions or something where it just didn't fit on one page? Some of this is in the Bashoon memo. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think I have my, I never saw the email. So I'm, I I'm right, sorry, and we can talk, you, well, we'll get to yeah, talk yeah. about that afterwards, but. Yeah, you want to speak? Well, I mean, we've yeah. talked about this extensively. Okay. Uh, 
I'm sure the director, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the conversations we've had with folks. Okay. Should I? Uh, yeah. Like to, uh, yeah. So, Madam Chair, remember, it's I. Uh, our previous conversations we've talked, I don't know who all has attended uh, which ones, but we've talked about um, ballot length as a big issue. So um, as Ray just mentioned, the, the law says if you're using an optical scan system, which is what we use, only one ballot card is allowed. Um, and there's every reason to believe that most elections um, we would not be able to fit things on two cards. So think back to what was it, 2013? was a notably long Minneapolis ballot, and we got 25, 35, 35 mayoral candidates. Uh, of course, they raised the filing fee after that, and that those went down. But um, our, our municipal election alone typically uh, is, is both sides of the, uh, of the ballot, as it is. So there's no way to add that to a presidential or gubernatorial year without going into two, two, two cards, right? So even without a lot of charter questions, um, uh, barring something odd, they wouldn't fit on um, one card. Uh, and Chair, what the, the election, the state ballot, uh, so we have, you know, we're, we're talking probably, uh, for, if we were to do this, it would be the year that the governor's on, not necessarily the president. So you will know, have at least one house of the legislature, maybe two, uh, governor, um, all the judges, right? Whatever constitutional amendment. And then, you would, oh, then you'd have the role offices like secretary of state, treasurer, auditor. Uh, no, secretary, auditor, attorney general. So there's no room for city stuff on the current general uh, state election ballot. So it would have to be two. And am, am I correct that usually at the state elections, when the judges are up, that's almost always the entire back of the ballot, mm -hmm. pretty much? I Do they occasionally things bleed from the front to the back? I mean, I'm used to the back being the judges, because I'm an election judge, and we always have to tell people to turn them over because there's stuff in the back. But, okay, so front is all we have to play with, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, uh, not sure. Um, the, the state law do allow for judges to actually bleed on to or go on to a second card. And I don't know how we then are in compliance with uh, the optical scan voting system that only allows one. So, um, as you remember, if you've been around voting for a long time, multiple ballot cards were common at some point. So there was there was the mauve ballot and the yellow ballot and the canary, you know. So there were all these different colored ballots um, that had different races. You had separate ballot boxes. Um, there are pieces of that that are still in law that, frankly, uh, just haven't been cleaned up for the most part. And there are places in the state that hand count their ballots. So the township with 75 people, they're not going to invest in this equipment that we use. They literally, the polls close, and the poll workers hand count all the ballots. And so in a jurisdiction like that, they could use a second ballot card for judicial races. Um, I don't know how common that is, but um, my understanding is the parts in the law where they do talk about multiple ballot cards are A, a holdover from how we used to do things. Um, B, they've removed everything but the judicial ballot, and then I don't think we could do that with an optical scan, is my understanding of the law, because they say if you use optical scan, it's got to all be on one ballot. Um, but it is a little confusing looking at the laws. I think, yeah, I think if people read the Bashu memo, it's obvious that we have some inconsistencies out there, and I'm not sure we can we can't fix that. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, sorry, I interrupted you, Mr. Chair. No problem, uh, Chair Sandberg and Chair Smith. Uh, we did. I don't know if this was your hypothetical, and we're talking a lot of hypotheticals here, but even in a non-ranked choice context, if there were so many charter questions or dozens and dozens and dozens of candidates. Uh, when we asked the county about that situation, like it's just not enough to, to fit on a ballot card because there's also limitations about the font size and the instructions, things like that. Basically, it's a, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it and we would either have to get some type of special authorization to, to use two ballot cards or push forward and do that and try to sustain any type of uh, challenge because it, 
the law doesn't really anticipate that is the interpretation that I think we've received. I would just think right now with everything going on around elections and people alleging fraud, I would be reluctant to try to do something that's outside the law just because we feel like we need to do it. So that would be a concern for me. It just would be one more reason for people to argue there's some fraudulent intent or something. I, I suspect our city clerk would not let us do anything outside the law. He's pretty <coughs> rigid about those things. But no, I think that's a good point, though. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mr. Kozak. Um, Mr. President, Chair, if there's a state law, the, the one, and I don't have the Carol's memo in front of me, but there's a state law that limits it to one card. Does that cover just state elections or municipal elections when you use, when you use optical scan? I think the optical scan language has been interpreted to cover all elections. Okay. So. Yeah. so we've never had a, even with the 35 candidates, we could fit it all in one? Uh, yeah, Chair Sam Bergen, Commissioner Kozak, and that was a challenge, uh, but the county was able to get it all in one. Yep. And, uh, yeah, because I think once we raise the, the filing fee, I, I do believe I cut the number down to about 17, kind of, kind of virtually in half. It was more of a challenge for those of us who had to hand count them after that election, which I did for like seven days or something. I did note here it says that uh, according to the sort of statutes, the Minnesota election law applies to municipal elections so far as practicable. Oh, I hate that word. So, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm putting that note down. Okay. We, we're interrupting. No, no. This and is, and um, it's a very informal meeting, so yeah. just wander around. I, I assume that this is how today's uh, meeting would go. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, the next bullet point, of course, talks about the order and form of offices. Don't allow for moving this collection to the end of the ballot to accommodate our city. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the, the whole notion that when a ballot changes uh, from what is typical uh, uh, election into an RC, RBC, RCP voting, it, it then would have to signify and say exactly how that is. And when you consider a ballot and when you consider the multiple races and the order in which municipal races would have to then be on the ballot, it would actually create one, a shift if you could fit it. And then two, as of right now, I don't believe there's technology that allows for for that, that that shift in county or though it, it might be entirely possible. And you know we, we talk a lot initially because the statute does allow for uh, a possible authorization for experimental use. And we have had conversations with the Office of Secretary of State and they would say that this would not be uh, an experimental use, this would be a use to try to go around several of the statutes that are in place that limit us what we can do. Did, did they happen to give you any examples of what they would consider appropriate experimental use? I was just curious when I saw the language. Of course, yes. Um, yeah, so Chair Sandberg, this has been around for a long time. There used to be like a state work group that um, would, would govern this, but now it's the Secretary of State that can do this authorization. And it's in the section of law that's about voting equipment. So um, I think the idea is the, these equipment change over time. You know, our, our, the rules for certification are kind of fixed to the current technology. And so if something new comes along, um, they could give a um, authorization to try it. So um, one thing that we, I don't know if it was ever tried, but we haven't gone to the, the kinds of machines where it's not paper, you just touch the screen and that it records your vote, right? And, and everybody's getting rid of those because everybody wants paper, which is good. We, we never had them. But that's the kind of thing I noticed like in the early 2000s, there was a work group looking at should we do an experimental authorization. And so there's all different vendors, all different technology that are coming up with things. Um, another example is uh, the electronic poll books that we use to check in voters, right, in Minneapolis. So I believe that was piloted through some experimental uh, authorization. Oh. So. Um, typically, they're innovations, technological innovations that they want to try out. Um, I, I also know Aaron can speak to 
um, efforts we made around right choice voting with this. Sure, I would just add that we've also heard from the state in, in the past about like the exact uh, envelopes that are used for absentee balloting. Sometimes mm -hmm. there was an experimental use authorization that changed that, allowed for a different design than was prescribed at one point um, with, I think, different vendors, different technology. And then to Jeff's point, uh, just last year ahead of the municipal election, we had put together a request um, through this type of statute in order to have automated ranked choice voting tabulation mm -hmm. system. And the response that we got back from the state was basically like, it, it didn't meet the experimental use authorization because there are no state statutes governing ranked choice voting. And so it was kind of this thing where, almost the like catch-22, it felt like where they can't experimentally authorize something if, if, it, if there's no statutes against which to compare them to um, at this point. So uh, they did kind of leave it up to, and uh, with most things with ranked choice at this point, up to the municipal level and, and our own uh, legal opinions and things like that, but there wasn't an avenue there in a, in a slightly different way. That, got a similar response here in the sense that uh, there's no, well, even in this case, there's there's laws that would preclude this type of action. So the chances of being authorized through that experimental use provision seem very unlikely, I think is how I characterize it from over here back. Oh, it sounds like when they talk about experimental use, they're talking about technology issues, not policy issues. not. You say we're trying to get around the laws. I, I can kind of see how they would see that. But. Okay. All right. Yes. And, and then, of course, uh, Madam Chair, the last couple of points is you know, we, we have spoken with the uh, County Elections, and they concur with the, the line we've been going down on what would be the obstacles to this process if you begin to do that. If you turn to page two, uh, there's RCB could be approved for a second page ballot, but it required two different optical scan voting systems. Uh, that, of course, would require changes in state law, and given the current conditions uh, in Minnesota, the landscape of the legislature is highly unlikely. There's current language proposed, uh, House File 2567, uh, that would accommodate the changes that we are talking about. Unfortunately, it's not moving in the legislature currently. And at this time, given the situation, we, we move forward to the ballot that the city would need to survive or defend any legal challenge that our elected to survive. Okay. So when you say two optical scan voting systems, you're literally meaning this ballot goes into this box and that ballot into that machine and this ballot would have two machines at each, each precinct? So kind, of, kind of like having... The pink and the buff ballots. Sure, exactly. Like two, two, two boxes that are electronic. Oh dear. I don't know how well that would work. Yeah. Well, I guess. That, was, that was my... Jose. I think you were on the, right on the mark. So in other words, the city would have to go out and buy Double, double, we have to duplicate our, machine, we have. our inventory of machines. And store them. Yeah. Oh dear. Out there okay. on 60 at the nickel. So there's that's, a budgetary yeah. impact that's fairly significant for that. And, and frankly, a voter, I mean, I've been an election judge long enough to, I'm always surprised at how easily confused voters can be. You know, put it in the wrong one. Oh, you have no idea. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> and and not and it's not being to to criticize voters. It can be confusing that if the room is crowded, there's people moving around. You know, it's easy to make mistakes, and a lot of voters do. I mean, we've had, you know, you have stories of people come back five, six times because they mismark their ballot. They keep redoing it, and it's not a matter of intelligence or anything. It's just a matter if you get flustered. Um, but. Having two machines, oh dear. Okay. And, and, and Madam Chair, there, there also then begins to be some issues around uh, the reconciliation of the uh, number of ballots and votes to the number of people registered to vote, which, as a uh, judge, you know that at the end of the night that has to be determined and there's a process to reconcile what, if there is a different count. And how would it affect the AV board work after the election? Were they, I've done that before too. 
and that comes in after the election with the boxes of the ballots, and you have to sit down and hand do everything. Right. I assume I, that would be a complication. I'm not sure it would be kind of another, this is, if we even could get there, there would also be a challenge on that reconciliation process. There's not a ton of clarity from what we've found about like, if somebody returns their ballot and they have one of the two cards in there, um, and then you having to count and have those reconcile mm -hmm. um, down the road. So it'd, it'd be certainly different than what many voters are, are currently used to um, with our, our elections, with being on one card. And then what I gathered from the way you've worded this is this is probably not a good year maybe the next few years aren't good years to try and touch the voting process too much because it's become very sensitive. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe your assessment is correct. Um, as we've watched uh, at the Capitol this year, any issues around voting have become hotly contested. Uh, and it's clearly, uh, there seems to be some partisan uh, sort of divisions on what to do around even in the uh, uh, TFL House, I don't believe the bill got any real serious consideration. Uh, oh, so it wasn't a Senate companion, it was just... There was a Senate companion. Was that, that went nowhere. It had five uh, TFL authors, yeah. okay. which, is, which is deadly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, politics. Sure, Sandberg. And, uh, Commissioner Kozak, uh, I don't believe the bill actually had a hearing at all in the legislature. I don't think there was a hearing. No, I don't. Yeah. It says in here, no hearing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I don't know if, um, since people have not had an opportunity to read the Bashun memo, I don't think we can really talk too much about it today. It pretty much provides a lot more detail about some of the things you said here. I mean, I, at least I've skimmed through it. I didn't read all the statutes because they're boring. But, uh, but I'm certainly happy to read, you know, her thought processes. Um, thank you very much. This is pretty straightforward. Right. Mr. Question. Smith, you should And I don't, I don't know if this is something you can answer, but would it be fair to say that city staff would probably be opposed <laughs> to changing <laughs> to even your elections? I think perhaps it might be better worded, would they find it difficult? I don't think staff would be comfortable saying that they're yeah, opposed to much of anything. I mean, that's what I would think. But I mean, it just seems like it would create a fair amount of problems for the city. Mm -hmm. So this would be, it would it be fair to say that this would offer a significant challenge to the city in terms of resources, technology, Staff time. Would that be fair? Okay, first yeah. Seven. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair Sandberg, I would say that um, other states do this all the time. All right, so Florida has a notorious thing. I don't know how many pages of zero balance. California as well. Um, I, I'm sure that we could come up with a legal and practical framework that this would be fine. Right, so other states do this a lot. We don't do it here. So there is a little bit of I'm scared of what I don't know. We don't have the laws that support mm -hmm. this process. So if we were to, you know, if we were to open up the laws and, and make this work, I'm sure it could. Uh, people don't like change. They complain at first. And then we probably, um, you know, but, um, where things stand now, I, I, it would, I think, bring a lot of um, confusion. And um, we wouldn't have good guidance on how to run that kind of approach. Um, so let me see, the sequence would have to be, in order for us to put it on the ballot, if we were so inclined, we'd have to have the law changed first. Sure. We, we couldn't just say, okay, let's, put, let's do this and then we won't implement it until it's legal. But my guess is the safest way, the prudent way to do it would be to uh, get the law changed so then we could do it. Uh, then we would, if we wanted, put it on the ballot. But how long, it, let's say the law was okay, we, were, we got that figured out. How much, the logistics of implementing this system, how long would it take to install it? 
Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner Kozak, I don't have those dates in front of me, but I know that in our previous, you uh, did it in the previous we, we did include a, a scenario of dates and um, state law allows us to deviate a year either side of when our election would normally take place. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that to actually make it happen, we would need in excess of a year uh, to sort of get things lined up yeah. to actually make it that, happen. That makes sense. You know, we would still have to go through working with the county for ballot design and all those uh, types of issues. Well, if we did this, and presumably uh, we wanted to do it for um, the year that the governor's up, so we wouldn't be able to well, we wouldn't be able to put this in, into action until 26, right? Correct. So we have, we have a four-year window. <laughs> uh, and commissioners, if I pulled the presentation from the March 22nd meeting of this work mm -hmm. group and. Right, coinciding with the midterm elections, the outline was that it would be uh, the 2025 municipal elections could be adjusted to a five-year term, and then that would line up with the, the 2030 oh, okay. um, midterm election. So it, it really is quite quite a ways out to line up to that uh, at this point. You know. Ray, you can worry about it. I'm not going to be here to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think. Well, to me, it's obvious, probably not, maybe not to other people, but frankly, until we can get the law changed, right. if there's a process that starts that the laws can be changed, we all know how this works in the legislature. We're going to be seeing this a year out, that this is what's going to happen. You have a lot of time before the laws get changed. It takes a lot of people to go and work, work the uh, legislators to get them to agree to our side, and often not in the first year. So at that time, you can start thinking about what other changes are needed. But until the law is changed, I, assuming what I read in the Bashun memo and what I'm hearing here, I, I, there's no way I would personally support trying to move forward because I just don't, I like laws. So, um, you know, they're there for a reason. Uh, are they inconsistent? Sure. Sure, Sam, I would mm -hmm. only mention that it is part of uh, Minneapolis's legislative platform right. uh, currently, just so you all know that mm -hmm. to support both the uh, change to uh, allow multiple ballot cards for ranked choice voting purposes and to adjust the ballot order that Ray outlined right. in order to allow those, you know, come out of order versus uh, right. where the law says now. So but, it is part of our platform. But we do need perhaps a more welcoming environment at the well, legislature for it. Maybe. Let me explain. I, and you I just, know more than I do. Anyway. I just looked up the bill. And the problem with the bill, one of the reasons it didn't go anywhere, yes, it allows the kind of changes that we would need to make what we're contemplating doing here, but it also authorizes ranked choice voting for state and federal elections. That's why oh. the bill didn't move. It didn't move because they didn't want to give us what we wanted on our little cosmetic changes uh, because rank, it, it would have a lot, we would have put the whole state on ranked choice voting for state and federal elections. And that is hugely controversial. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure when the, the legislature is going to, legislature is going to be hospitable to that. Uh, okay. There's bipartisan, there's bipartisan support for that, but there's also significant bipartisan opposition. And Chair Sammer, Commissioner Kozak, to that point, is We've asked, and it's part of I think the League of Minnesota Cities platform to basically yeah. decouple those those items and allow the kind of systemic uh, voting systems side of things have regulation. So that it says if you have ranked choice, here's some parameters in which you can operate away from the uh, the kind of expansion of statewide. But you're right, you're correct. We haven't seen that in bills, proposed bills yet. So Commissioner mm -hmm. Smith, do you have any insight into what the league is doing? No? I don't. I could find out, but I don't know. That might be interesting to know if I was curious, a chance. Has Minneapolis ever had even your elections? You know, just like when the general laws require or says even your elections and then the city can change it. But I was just wondering, are, was there ever a charter amendment that 
switch this to odd year? These, these are the people who would know. Yeah. Um, it's been a while. Just have her there. Uh, Commissioner Smith, I, I believe that would be a good question for Casey Carroll, our city clerk. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not that important. I'm just no, curious. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, we can I, we'll find out. Okay. Good luck. I don't think since uh, the 19th century. Yeah. And none of us remember that far back, thank God. <laughs> I've been accused of knowing that far back. But. I'm not going there. Chair Sandberg and commissioners, if I could just add, um, having, having the good fortune of spending several years at the state capitol, uh, one of the things that I think the city is trying to do is work with the league to make sure that this isn't a Minneapolis only mm -hmm. issue. And, and the reason that I say that is oftentimes at the Capitol, uh, many legislators aren't inclined to support something that's special for Minneapolis. Uh, so I, I think as we continue to move forward uh, with trying to get state laws changed around elections, if we make them more appear to be statewide, not necessarily making all statewide elections, RCD, uh, and federal elections, RCD, but uh, some of the issues related to it, because you know, we're the city that's sort of coming to this point right now, and there are chances that other cities that have switched over to ranked choice voting might possibly see these things coming in the future as well. And there are several that did have switched in the last five or six years, I think, right? That's right. I think Bloomington passed yeah. last year. Or so, years. correct, commissioners. Um, so Minneapolis was 2009, St. Paul 2011, then St. Louis Park 2019, and then Bloomington and Minnetonk had their first ranked choice elections just last year in 2021. Um, in conversations with the state, we did hear that other communities that had considered ranked choice, um, they mentioned Red Wing, kind of backed off after learning about some of the even year Duluth. issues. Duluth. Um, also, Duluth, Duluth has right, rejected it on a ballot measure. Oh, they did. Um, and actually, just last week, uh, Brooklyn Park, uh, I always get the Brooklyn's mixed up, Brooklyn Park's Charter Commission, I believe, was discussing ranked choice voting, and Brooklyn Park has even year municipal election. So oh. we had a little bit of correspondence with their city clerk, and I was happy to share. I said, here's the LIMS file for all the discussion that has been happening in Minneapolis over um, the past number of weeks. So anyway, it is, it is being considered, and I don't know how much of a of a hindrance it is to those communities that currently have even year elections for municipal races. Mm. Any other questions? Commissioner Barrett, anything? You know, this isn't a legal question, but um, I don't know that we talked about cost mm -hmm. of an election. Well, I think he may have alluded to some significant cost issues potentially, but nothing Adding specific. Issues. Well, you know, that whole conversation didn't make any sense to me. That you'd have two different machines. Are you literally saying there's two different machines in the city right now? No, no, the, the, if they were allowed to do the two ballot thing. I know, but we have we have even and odd year elections. So are, are there a set of machines for even years and then set for odd? Same. It's the same machine. But it's program. Correct. Same, same machine, commissioners. But I think the, program. the point Different. was that it was if we can only use one ballot card per optical scan machine. It'd be almost like running. It would be like running two elections, separate ballot cards, separate machines on the same day to kind of circumvent this, this so rule. Back to my question about cost. What what does it cost to run an election in in the not here? What's the cost? Can we add this year? Like municipal year. Municipal year, okay. Yeah. Municipal year. Do you have access to the residency? I know. Should. Um, it, it, Aaron can look it up, but I can say um, our, our biggest cost is, is the workforce. So it's going to be about $2,000 election judges, a couple hundred additional seats in the Well, you can do that with the ballot card. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I guess I'm all speculating. I one time cost? No, uh, those are annual, um, so some sort of annual rent. rent. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, rent. Um, What's that? So they're rented, so you can't just buy them and amortize them. Right, so in Minnesota, the counties control the equipment. Um, and uh, they basically control the whole process except mm -hmm. that they delegate to the cities. Mm -hmm. right. and, uh, my, my guess is there would still be enough cost savings. Um, but I don't want to speak that I'm just getting a feeling. I, I have a, through Sandberg, I have a different feeling. I have a feeling from the beginning staff has been not very favorable about this. And that's the slant that we're getting. I don't feel that this has been, um, that there's a way to try to figure out how to go about making this work. It seems more that like each presentation that I listen to, it's about how it's not going to work. Well, I think that they've identified some significant problems. I think in our very first presentation, I should go back and look, I think we did talk about that there would be savings in terms of not holding an election. Yeah. But we, that's going to have to be balanced off. I, you're right, we've never seen a presentation that said, okay, if we could do this in a certain way, how much would we save here and how much does it cost there? I, I agree, we have not seen that. Well, I, we haven't asked for it. Also, the drop-off rate was conjecture. I didn't, you know, I asked for that information last time, what kind of drop what do other cities see for drop off from if they have it during when a governor is running? How much drop off is there at the municipal level? And we heard, I thought, pretty extreme numbers that there would be a 30% drop off rate. And based on what? Oh, there were some articles that were out there, but that's about it. I don't, I we, don't, we don't know here because we don't, we don't do it, but it would so, help the other states. I know, so I mean, if we're going to take this seriously, I think that has to be back to them, too. Okay. So, see if we can find out something about drop And I really would like to know about the cost. I mean, I, I think there's two things, for me, there's two things going on here. There's one is the generating more people out of the polls, and the other is what kind of cost savings can we make for an election. So those are the two factors for me. Now, when you say generating more people polls, you're making it very simple. Voters, that more voters. You would get additional voters beyond what you would get for a gubernatorial race coming for the municipal races? No, that you'd have more people turning out for the municipal uh, voting, actual oh, the voting, voting part of municipal, okay. okay. And the municipal okay, races. Okay, so you'd have a higher turn out for that yeah. specific race. I don't think we're going to see, for, for example, I don't think we're going to see the, we, we've seen some, uh, we saw a record turnout last time, but there were some very controversial amendments on the ballot, and I think that drove the election. And I think without those, we would have seen something very different. You could test that by looking at what the drop-off or what the differentials were between those questions and the voting for the specific board candidates. I don't know what those numbers are, but that they should be out there. That'd be interesting to you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need, perhaps, you know, your, your point's well taken. Um, I think we need, uh, the staff, you guys can get come up with some, with the cost of a, what the election costs back in 2021, and then how much the machines, what the rent is to double up on the rent for the machines, that should be relatively easy to ascertain. And then, uh, but we probably need more than just some articles and some anecdotes about the, the undervote. So here's what they vote for governor, and how many people, now, oddly enough, if you have two sheets, chances are you're going to optimize uh, people voting rather than, the hell, I've got two sheets, I have to fill them up, rather than having to turn them over like for the don't judges. Know. But we don't know. So I think we would have to commission or do something more serious than just some articles from some other cities. Uh, 
Uh, and there, there's undervotes. There's undervotes uh, for presidential. Uh, going from president down to legislature. Going president down to. Uh, President uh, to Senate, you'll still see, you'll even see. Yeah. Federal, you'll see. And then down to judges, it's pathetic. Most of them are unopposed, and there's a philosophy yeah. of do you bother to vote if there's no yeah. office, you know, that's the whole I think everybody's like me. I look for, well, I know this guy. It's for somebody you know, whether you like them or not. That's what I do. <laughs> I leave most of them blank. But there's got to be, I'm sure there's some scholarly, there's been some scholarly, uh, analysis of, of undervoting, and maybe we can have somebody ch check that out, see if we can find something that, that talks about that. Because to me, the, my instinct says, leave it alone, because I don't, I have, I'm concerned that city election issues will get buried or uh, because of, a, like this year, I mean, city election compared to governor and the whole legislature, uh, we got big issues, whether it's inflation, abortion, all those things are going to be how people are going to be making up their minds, and uh, so the city will get lost in the shuffle. That's my fear. I think that's what Fisher Smith brought up months ago, was the whole why the League of Cities was making some recommendations or not concern about, I don't know, contamination. I don't know what the right word yeah. is. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to those questions, but I think certainly that's possible. But that um, is the question. Yeah. So that goes back to my, my point about the drop off. If people are, if there is some research that shows that people do drop off, then that would prove your point. But we don't have any. You don't really have yeah. Yeah. Right now. now you're talking about research specific to Minnesota. I would say the only articles I've seen are outside of Minnesota. I would take your data from wherever we could get it. So you're looking at from the last. There's a research paper out okay. of California. Let's look at it. Yeah, I thought we had some of those, but we'll go back and take a look at the documents. That I don't remember there. seeing anything like that, but you know. We, it may very well be there. I just don't remember seeing the articles. Mm -hmm. So, I, I will, excuse me, I will say one of the things that I think we need to do is, given the amount of time this process would take, mm -hmm. whatever we should do is we should still put some urgency on it now because we, if we don't do anything for two years, the rest of the process is still going to take, as staff has pointed out, half a dozen years. Mm -hmm. So I think we, I, I would just say sort of to maybe cap this off is that I, I still feel a sense of urgency about ma making a, some sort of decision. Continuing to work in that direction. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah. But for that reason, because the, there are so many other steps that are involved in the process, and they're they are long, time-consuming steps. Okay. Well, it might be useful to get um, some numbers. I don't know exactly where to look on the whole drop-off just in Minnesota elections, from the top of the ballot down. Don't count the judges. But yeah, I know stuff. people use judge, no, judges. No, the judges, that's yeah. not yeah. fair. No, that's not fair. Let's um, look at the other Split stuff. the difference. Yeah. But uh, constitutional amendments is, is a good one. Because there's usually a, there's a significant drop off between mm -hmm. the vote for governor and if there's a constitutional amendment on the ballot. But those are kind of different too because is it a, if you don't vote on it, isn't that a no vote? That's a no vote. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a it's, a, it's a majority of those who showed up to vote that day rather than ours is for our charter, it's a, a 50 percent point one. 51 percent. 51 percent of the vote of voting on the question. 
but in the state, it's you have to have a majority of those who sh actually showed up to vote. And there's about a four or five percent difference. Depends on the issue, how controversial it is. Um, so there's ways of looking at it. Okay. Um, some genius over at Humphrey Institute could figure it out. Well, it sounds to me what I'm hearing from the committee, and I haven't talked to Chair Clegg, um, that we still want to move forward with looking at these issues. We're not we're not giving up yet. Um, but there could be some information that would be useful, especially maybe some of the drop-off information and so forth from our own elections, and digging around for committee members to go and work group members to look and see if we can find other articles or research that's looked at some of the questions Commissioner Perry is raising. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, w I would love to, maybe you guys have someone over at the view of that has done some of this research already or knows where that research could be found, I'd love to talk to them. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners, there was a paper from uh, 2018. It was done as a capstone project and it compared drop-off rates and looked at that uh, relative to even year elections. Uh, they compared us to other cities like Atlanta, Kansas City, Seattle, other cities. And it was a wide range of uh, sort of percentage of drop-offs. Uh, in these more larger cities, it was between 5 to 25%. And you know, I would just caution us on looking at those numbers to say, there we go. Uh, because depending on the type of elections that are on the ballot, it's kind of hard to tell what's driving the drop-off mm -hmm. uh, versus not driving the drop-off. And then we've also seen um, some other papers that have been produced by some think tanks. Uh, and, and I always get a little skeptical of think tanks when they produce papers. Of, of what grade? Uh, uh, think tanks. Uh, oh, think tanks? Some, some tend to be a bit more conservative than others. Or, or yeah. tendentious. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I think that, you know, Definitely there is some research out there. Uh, happy to present that to all of you. I'm, I'm not sure if we included it in the packet originally, the capstone project, uh, but I know that Chair Clay has brought up the revitalizing local democracy in the case for on cycle elections. Yes, which that was came up early. Put out by the Manhattan Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, um, if you go from a scope, you know, from a line of really, really left to really, really right, uh, institutes or think tanks, it tends to fall uh, closer to the middle, uh, more right. And this paper focuses a lot on school boards and talking about school board elections. So um, I would just I would just suggest that as you, you start to digest some of this information, that those are some of the factors that that sort of come into your thinking relative to that. We're, we're happy to continue to try to dig up more research about drop-off, and I'm sure the Secretary of State probably has some numbers relative to drop-off uh, in elections throughout the state of Minnesota, and I, I'm guessing it probably varies too across the state. Mm -hmm. So cer certainly happy to, to get that information as well. And we can talk to Chair Clegg too, I suspect he usually does. Okay, was there anything else? Any other questions for the elections group? Mr. Smith? Oh. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. We appreciate this. It will, we'll move forward on our thinking. We'll see where we go, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. And uh, seeing no other discussion to be had, I think we'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everybody.